What's up, podcast friends? And thank you for listening to the College Admissions Process Podcast. While analyzing the podcast data, I realized that many of the earlier episodes, some of which received the most overall downloads and are still extremely relevant today, are not being listened to as much as the newly released episodes. This is why I created the alphabetical list of colleges available on the podcast with the link to the related interview to the right of each school. Please use the alphabetical list as part of your college search, which can be found in the show notes and on my website, www.collegeadmissionstalk.com. The alphabetical list serves as an on-demand virtual college fair with schools from throughout the country. It also emphasizes, for example, that episode 132 is no more or less important than episode 92. To highlight how valuable the alphabetical list is, I will release past episodes that receive the highest overall downloads on Wednesdays throughout the summer. Please share the alphabetical list with anyone you think that may benefit, as it has proven to be such a valuable tool for so many listeners. So are you ready? Let's talk about it. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you today Ben Carpenter, who's the Assistant Director of Admissions at Carnegie Mellon University. Ben, thank you so much for being with us today. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Yeah, uh, thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here. It is our pleasure, and we are excited to hear about all of the great things that Carnegie Mellon has to offer its students. So, Ben, let's get right to it. What is it about Carnegie Mellon University that makes it so appealing for so many students to want to apply and ultimately attend? Yeah, uh, it's a great question to start off. I, there really are a lot of exciting things happening here at Carnegie Mellon, uh, both in and out of the classroom, of course. We really have world-class programs in both tech and the arts. Um, so we've got six different academic colleges and schools here, and uh, there's something for, for everyone, really, you know, on the academic side of things. Um, and we are, you know, really having a lot of exciting things happening um, kind of across the board academically. So the uh, writer director of um, the Academy Award winning film CODA this year uh, was a Carnegie Mellon College of Fine Arts graduate. Wow. Um, we've got folks um, around campus working on a uh, rover that will be on Mars in 2023. So there's just <laughs> a whole slew of different things. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's really um, an exciting place. And I think, you know, some of the things that really attract students to Carnegie Mellon specifically are the opportunities for collaboration and interdisciplinary work uh, on the academic side of things. So, you know, we've got students that are um, kind of using those cross-disciplinary connections, both in the classroom and out, to really kind of supplement their their experience here at Carnegie Mellon. They don't say siloed in their own, you know, particular major or academic program, but but really do have that collaborative work environment with, with students around campus. Uh, so that's definitely, you know, something that's, that's pretty paramount to the, the Carnegie Mellon experience. And I think is, is a big reason that, that a lot of students are specifically, you know, interested in or, or attracted to Carnegie Mellon. Well, thank you so much for that intro, Ben. We really appreciate it. And how many applications do you review a year? And do you, Ben, represent a specific region? Yeah, so um, we, uh, it varies a bit from, you know, year to year, uh, of course, but uh, over the last couple of years, we've had somewhere between 30 and 35,000 applicants to wow. Carnegie Mellon overall. <laughs> um, so the way that we do uh, read applications is um, perhaps different than, than some other places. Uh, we don't read by like a specific geographic territory or region. Uh, we read by academic college or school. Um, and so it, it just kind of varies, you know, a bit based on on those. And students who are applying to Carnegie Mellon apply directly to the college or school that they're interested in. So again, we have, we have six of them. And so our, our admission committees are, are spread out kind of around those um, or, or across those six different uh, colleges and schools. And, and so there can, can be, you know, any, uh, any number of thousands, depending on, on kind of how things shake out. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a, an arduous process. Um, and then in, in a good way, I mean, you know, there, it's, it's really exciting to see so many different uh applicants from across the country and across the world. And I, that's one thing that I do like about that side of it is, you know, we're not just reading from a particular area geographically, and, and we're, we're really seeing just all kinds of different, different applicants across the board. So can you walk us through that process? Let's dig deeper just a little bit more in terms of how you evaluate so many applications. Ben, any insight that you could give us would uh, be truly appreciated. This is something that parents and students and, and I <laughs> certainly want to hear about. 
<laughs> yeah, of course. So we we practice a holistic admission review process here at Carnegie Mellon. So you know we're looking at a number of different factors, and you know, this may be something we we touch on in more detail later on too. But um, it, you know it's it's really going to be kind of that holistic picture of the applicant. Um, every application is going to be touched by by a reader. So we we also don't have specific minimum requirements for, you know, GPA, SAT or ACT scores, things like that. Um, so we were really are looking at that, that whole picture of the student, you know, in, in terms of the numbers, again, it, it can kind of vary based on, on what academic college or school that, that someone's reading for. And it, so those, they're kind of spread out across, across the six different colleges or schools. But as we're reading applications through that holistic review lens, we are really looking for reasons to admit students. We're not looking for reasons not to admit students. So uh, there's there's not typically going to be one factor alone that is the reason a student is admitted or not admitted. And, um, you know, again, we're we're looking for those things that we can use to to advocate for the student being being admitted. Well, thank you so much for that. And so speaking of the students, what is the average profile of the current freshman class? Yeah. So, I mean, th- this will vary again based on on college or school, too, um, because we are that direct admission program. So what you would see from the School of Computer Science, for example, could be different in, in certain ways than our um, type of school of business or, you know, uh, kind of along down the line. And really, I mean, you know, kind of in general, um, the averages are, are going to be on probably the higher end, you know, the, the GPA scale for sure in that probably 3.75 to 4.0 sort of range. But once again, it's, that's not the most important aspect of the application. There's not any any factor that outweighs another in terms of importance. Uh, and and again, we also don't have like those specific minimum requirements or cutoffs or anything like that for any any of our academic programs. So um, we're really interested in you know the journey that that the student is on academically, um, kind of throughout the their their process in high school. Same thing with. I really the GPA or or test scores, SAT or ACT exams, and you know those are those are data points that we can use to to advocate for the student being admitted, uh, kind of overall. Um, so yeah, I mean we've we were test optional for for the last two academic cycles. We will be for for fall twenty twenty three as well. So that's that's can be a factor if you know if a student chooses to submit their scores to us, but if they don't, it's, it's not going to hurt their application in any way. And we'll come back to the test optional, but I was curious, Ben, do you use the student's high school GPA as indicated on their transcript or do you recalculate using your own metrics? And if so, what are you looking at? Yeah, so so we do use uh, an unweighted GPA. So um, if that's provided on the student's transcript, you know, we'll use that. If it is weighted, then then we'll we'll unweight it. But we don't consider the ninth grade year in in the GPA calculation. You know, we, we recognize that's a transitional year for, for many students and isn't necessarily indicative of, of future success. So um, we, we're not using that the ninth grade year in, in terms of the GPA calculation or, 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 you know, anything along those lines. You know, we're really looking at um, obviously like what coursework is students have taken and, and um, how well they've done that coursework. But also when it comes to course rigor, we're looking at that kind of compared to what is, is available for the student at their high school. So it's all within the context of their their high school and, and what coursework is available to them and and if they're challenging themselves based on that available coursework and again like I said a minute ago it's it's another it's it's one factor of many it's a it's a data point that we can use overall um, through through our our review process. Hey John, this is Danny from the University of Rhode Island. Dormify is my go-to for the most trend-forward and unique products for all of my rooms over the years. I love that no matter how my style changes, I can always go to Dormify for inspo to style my space. I cannot recommend it enough for anyone wanting to make their space their own. Thanks so much, John. Thank you, Danny, for introducing Dormify to our listeners. Dormify is a one-stop shop for stylish and functional dorm decor, offering a wide range of stylish and functional products for anyone looking to decorate their dorms or small spaces. From bedding to wall decorations to storage solutions, Dormify has everything you need to transform your living space into a comfortable and stylish home away from home. Use our exclusive coupon code College Talk. that's one word, college talk to save 15 percent on most products when you shop at dormify.com or through the link provided in the show notes please note that if you make a purchase through the affiliate link or coupon code we provided the podcast will receive a small commission from dormify 
But rest assured, we would only promote products that we truly believe in and think will benefit our listeners. And now, back to the show. Understood, and I appreciate you sharing about the ninth grade year and how you don't use it in the overall process. That's great insight. We appreciate that, Ben. Thank you so much. And Ben, if a prospective student falls a little below the current freshman class's average, what are some of the things they can do to enhance their application? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, through the, the holistic admission review process, it's it's not going to be, um, you know, necessarily the, the end all be all. We always, you know, recommend that students, you know, if they're looking at averages or kind of getting a ballpark of, of where students are at academically, if they are a little below those, we, we still recommend you know, if, if you have the interest, you, you should apply. I mean, you, you can't be admitted if you don't apply. So, um, so you know, it, we, we don't want that to deter students. Um, if you look at an average for, for a particular college or school, we are, you know, every single year, we are going to be admitting students that are above that and below that um, in terms of GPA or test scores or anything like that. And so it really is, you know, typically going to be like the middle 50%. So it's just if you lined all the students up and took that middle chunk out, you know, that, that's, that's where they're at. So that means there definitely are students above and below that are being admitted. And, um, you know, we're, we're definitely always taking into consideration the, the overall context for the individual student. So, um, you know, if there's things that they're um, providing to us through their application um, or, you know, whether it's directly from the student or through a school counselor or teacher recommendation, things like that, you know that they're we're always taking that context into into consideration if if there you know is, is something going on you know for that student individually so um, that that all gets factored in as well and um, you know it's it's kind of the the again the, the journey that's that's important um, overall as opposed to you know a, a specific grade in a course or here or there or anything along those lines and so students can definitely show us through their application in many different ways why they would be a good fit for Carnegie Mellon, both academically and otherwise. And and so GPA just happens to be one of the ways they can do that, but it's it's not going to be the sole reason, you know, typically that a student is, is going to be admitted or not admitted. I appreciate that. And you mentioned earlier that Carnegie Mellon has six different schools that the students can apply to. Ben, could you give us a little bit of insight in terms of the different ways that students can apply to each of these programs? Yeah. So um, in general, there's only one way really through the common application. So that's, that's the <laughs> way to apply. Um, but we do have um, a couple of different application plans that students can choose from. So we have um, an early decision one and early decision two plan, as well as a regular decision plan. Um, Carnegie Mellon does not offer early action. Um, so it's just early decision or regular decision. Both early decision one and two plans are binding application plans. So if a student applies under early decision, and is admitted, then we expect them to enroll at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and we do get the vast majority of our applicants, admitted students, and enrolled students each year through the regular decision plan. Uh, so um, this can vary, obviously, by institution. But for us, we get the vast majority of students through regular decision. And students who apply early to Carnegie Mellon are not any more likely to be admitted than those who apply under regular decision, which, again, that that is definitely something that can change depending on the institution. But for us, really, the benefit is that that you find out your admission decision sooner, and that's kind of it, because there is not an inherent advantage to the applicant to applying early as opposed to regular. So for early decision one and two, we really recommend that Carnegie Mellon be the, the student's first choice because it is that binding application. Functionally, they are exactly the same. It's really just the, the calendaring and the dates of the deadline and, and notification that are different between early decision one and early decision two it really usually works out to be that early decision two is the best fit for a student who who maybe Carnegie Mellon was their second choice initially and they applied early decision somewhere else or not admitted. And so then Carnegie Mellon becomes their first choice. And so they, they want to apply under that early decision two plan. Um, and, and so those are, are kind of the, the, the main ways. We do have um, what's called uh, early admission, which um, folks might see on our website or through an information session that we host, things like that. Early admission is for highly qualified high school juniors that have exhausted coursework at their high school. So they, they are graduating early because there is no other coursework for them to take in high school. So those application numbers are, are generally very small um, it, in, you know, maybe double digits total, um, you know, for each year. Um, so so we it's really just that early decision and regular decision plan. Um, but yeah, those, that, that's, that's really it. Um, the common application itself is, is the, the way to apply. 
Understood. And again, thank you so much for that insight. And we know that Carnegie Mellon has tremendous programs, particularly in engineering, computer science, architecture, the fine arts. So I'd like to ask, do students audition or have to submit a portfolio for any one of these programs? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the, the short answer is yes, um, for, <laughs> for some. So um, for all applicants, we're looking at a few different things um, in terms of materials, obviously the high school transcript, um, and then um, SAT or, or ACT scores, if the student's choosing to, to submit them, which I know we'll, we'll talk about in, in just a moment in terms of test optional stuff. But if a student is, a, is choosing to submit scores, you know, th- those are considered. We require one school counselor recommendation and then one recommendation from a teacher of the student's choice. So it doesn't have to be a teacher that teaches in, in the, you know, the field or the subject that they want to study or anything like that. It can be the, the, a teacher of their choice. Um, there are three short answer questions that are part of the Carnegie Mellon specific supplement to the common application. And those are the same for all applicants. So it's the th- same three short answer questions. And then we're also interested in um, kind of the, we, we call it non-academic information. Um, also extracurriculars, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, so really for, for us, that's anything the student is doing when they're not like in class or, or in school. So it could be a school sponsored club or sport, could be a job or a service organization that students a part of, could be helping care for a family member at home, really anything that they're doing along those lines, you know, when they're not in class. And so that's what we're looking for from all applicants. And then applicants to our college of fine arts programs would have some additional requirements. So for the visual arts programs, which are architecture, art, and design, there would be a portfolio review that, that is, is um, part of that. So the students would need to submit a portfolio. And then for the uh, performing arts programs of drama and music, there's typically a, a pre-screen and an audition process uh, for, for those programs. So um, those are the, the portfolio reviews and audition reviews are handled directly by the, the the school that the student's applying to. So, so you know, in, in, in an example of a student applying to architecture, the, the academic review of their general application is done by our office of admission. And then the review of the uh, architecture portfolio would be done directly by the school of architecture. So um, they're kind of handled by the, the separate uh, entities in, in that way. Understood. And thank you so much for that explanation. Ben, have you seen an overall shift with the recent adoption of the test optional policies that you and a lot of other colleges and universities are adapting. How do you see this impacting the future of college admissions? Yeah, uh, it's a it's a really great question. Um, no doubt, um, we we've seen you know a, a shift and a change. Um, we definitely have seen a more diverse applicant pool since uh, we we elected to go test optional. Um, you know, I I think. For us specifically, the university has done a validity study on the SAT and, and the, um, the indicator, the, the connection to, to an indication that it has a future success. The strongest indicator of success was GPA and SAT or ACT scores. But having the SAT or ACT scores actually had a, a very small percentage increase in, in that indication. So, wow. um, you know, we, we're still studying whether it's something that we will do long term and kind of from here on out um, in, in terms of being test optional, we will be test optional for the upcoming fall 2023 applicant class. Um, but I mean, really, we have almost a, a one year's completion of, of data and that's it. Um, yeah, at least for us. So, you know, we're, we're still studying whether that will be something, you know, long term that, that, that we will be doing, but, but definitely for this upcoming year we will be test optional and it'll be the same as the last couple of years, which is just that if a student for whatever reason, wasn't able to submit SAT or ACT scores, they couldn't sit for the exam. Um, Hopefully there's, there's not any other pandemic that that (laughs) prevents students from doing it in the way that it has, you know, the last couple of years. But um, if, if they're also not, you know, choosing not to submit scores to us, it's not going to hurt their application in any way. We get asked a lot. Well, should I like, do you think I should submit my scores? And it's really obviously up to the student, but we, we recommend just going with what the student feels presents their strongest application. So if that's with scores, great. If it's not with them, if you, you know, if you took the exam and, and didn't feel great about your results, don't feel that it's, you know, a, a strong representation of you as a student, you don't need to submit them to us and you're not going to be penalized for that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we've, the last couple of years, we've been in the neighborhood of 60 to 60% of students who are asking us to consider scores. So 
you know, that 60, 65% kind of range. And um, the percentage of students that are admitted that have submitted scores is right in the same neighborhood. So we've, you know, it's not like we've had a huge increase in students asking us not to sub, not to consider scores, but then we're not admitting any of those students. They really kind of mirror each other in, in terms of percentages for the most part, um, you know, between the students who are saying, I'd like you to consider scores and, and those that are admitted on that side and, and the other way around as well. Well, I appreciate that. And if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you the question again. I know that you just shared it, but I want to make sure that we're clear. In other words, could you share again the percentage of students that opted to, number one, not submit their scores with their application? And a follow-up to that is the current freshman class. In other words, what is the percentage of students that were accepted who, in fact, did not submit test scores? If you could just repeat and share, we would really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. So um, the, the percentage of students over the last couple of years who have asked us not to consider scores is going to be in the 35 to 40 percent range of the total applicant pool. And the percentage of those students who we admitted is going to be right around that 40 percent range or you know, 35 to 40 percent range of students who have been admitted who have asked us not to consider scores. So, yeah. Well, that's a good piece of information because a lot of times parents and students hear that a school is test optional, particularly a school like Carnegie Mellon, which of course we all know is competitive. You know, it's not easy to get into. It's definitely a competitive school, one of the top schools in the nation and beyond. So we appreciate you sharing that. So you're saying that in terms of the accepted students, it's somewhere around 35 to 40 percent of them that were accepted, but in fact did not submit test scores. So that's a very important piece of information. I appreciate you sharing that, Ben. Thank you so much. Ben, how important are students' courses in progress and grades in their senior year? And do you ever request to see a student's mid-year grades before issuing a decision? Um, yeah. So I think it's definitely an important piece of the the, the picture and, and, and the the overall application for students, um, like we talked about, sort of you know at the beginning, it's it's one factor of many, so it's not the the most important thing or anything along those lines. We're we're really interested in you know overall, obviously students who who are demonstrating through their coursework that they're pre they're academically prepared for Carnegie Mellon. I mean, student success is is what's most important to us, so we, we certainly want to make sure that students are you know, academically prepared, but we're also taking into consideration the full context of their senior year and, and anything that they're, they're providing in their application. So um, it's possible that we could ask for, for mid-year grades. I, I wouldn't say that it's um, particularly common overall, um, but it, it's, it's really just going to be kind of determined by the individual context for the student. And, you know, if there, there's something that, that we maybe we'd want to see in, in that mid-year grade report. But um, overall, you know, we're, we're kind of looking at the, the overall high school journey for the student and the, the context in, in which they've taken their coursework and, and, and succeeded in, in that coursework specifically. Well, we appreciate again the insight. And Ben, what are some examples of college essays that really stuck with you? In other words, when you read them, you might have said, this kid must come to Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think, um, you know, Seeing such a diverse group of applicants it's, is is really uh, one of the things I enjoy the most about about this job. And and there are so many great students that we're hearing from that, that are applying each year. Um, I think the ones that really stand out are the the students who are like just their true authentic selves through throughout their their essays and and the short answer questions that are specific to Carnegie Mellon and that kind of thing. And who can really articulate like here's why I think. I'm a good fit for Carnegie Mellon and vice versa. And, you know, here's what I think that I can bring to the Carnegie Mellon community that's unique. And, and so the students who are, are doing that and who are really, you know, kind of showing through their essay and short answer questions and really throughout their whole application that they really share, you know, some of those core competencies that, that are important to Carnegie Mellon um, and the, the Carnegie Mellon core competencies. So, you know, things like um, pro-social mo motivation, um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, um, you know, kind of that institutional global learning interest and interest in collaboration and, and interdisciplinary work and study, like, like we talked about at the beginning. And I, you know, I think those are the, are really the ones that, that stand out. Um, and it's, you know, it's really easy to, to kind of get a sense of the passion that students have for their particular academic program and their other non-academic interests and all that kind of thing. Um, and so, so the, you know, those students who are really 
kind of um, portraying that passion and, and just being their, their true authentic selves are, are the ones that always stand out the most. Well, that's a great piece of advice. Thank you again, Ben. And a student's activity sheet is another piece of their application. Ben, what are the kinds of things that you are looking for beyond the work they did in the classroom? Yeah, um, there's really not a specific box for this sort of thing. I mean, you know, broad strokes, certainly, you know, we're interested in students who are um, interested in and, and kind of have a have a passion for other, you know, helping others, that pro-social media motivation piece, uh, you know, leadership, things like, like that. But there's definitely not a, a, you know, very specific rubric that we have that, oh, okay, you know, student has X, Y, Z. Um, position or or organization or things like that. I mean, we want to know what students are passionate about and what what makes them who they are. Uh, you know, at, not only as a student but as a person as well. So, you know, that's why that non-academic information can really be anything under the sun that the student is doing outside of the classroom. And and that's you know, we're interested in that not only from a context perspective, so we can know kind of what that student's um, you know individual situation is like, but also just the things that are important to them, um, the, the ways that they spend their time are, you know, pretty indicative of, of you know, those those things um, that are of importance. And so we're, we're really kind of looking for, for anything and everything that a student is doing, uh, you know, outside of the classroom, whether it's directly related to, to their high school or, or to, um, uh, you know, a job or organization, or, or it's just something that they, you know, have a really strong passion for and are pursuing kind of on their own. Well, we appreciate that, Ben. And what about students aspiring to play sports in college? What advice would you have for a prospective student athlete in terms of making their intentions to play known? Yeah, I think, you know, at Carnegie Mellon specifically, um, the, the best piece of advice is to, to reach out to the coaching staff of the particular um, sport. You know, we, we are an NCAA Division three institution, so we're not offering any, any athletic scholarships or anything along those lines, but uh, it's definitely a competitive recruiting process. So we definitely recommend, you know, student reaching out to, to the coaching staff. Um, I think all of the, the sports on our athletic website have a recruiting questionnaire that the student can fill out. And, you know, the contact info is, is kind of there. But I mean, we're, you know, you hear the term student athlete. It's definitely the case here. It's students here um, that are participating in athletics are definitely students first. But, you know, that, that athletic piece can, can be a really big part of their, their Carnegie Mellon experience as well. Well, that's terrific, Ben. Thank you so much. And by the way, I will include the Carnegie Mellon Office of Admissions website link in the show notes of the podcast. If there's anything else you want me to include, please provide it to me and I'll make it available, of course, to all of the students and parents. So Ben, in closing, what are the top three pieces of advice you would give a student and their parents who are getting ready for the college admissions process? Yeah, uh, it's a great, great question. Um, I you know, <laughs> definitely don't think that that um, my pieces of advice are are you know the, the most important necessarily or anything like that. But, you know, just just from kind of what um, what I've seen over the years, I think number one is uh, I guess in in really no particular order. Number one would be to not get immediately turned off or or discouraged by the cost of an institution that you would see up front. I think. You know, you really want to want to know if that school is a good fit for you, um, and and vice versa. And um, really, you know, you may have an idea of of what something might might look like financial aid wise for you at that particular institution, but you won't know for sure until until you you know you go through that process formally. So especially if if folks are starting this process early, like you know when the student says sophomore or junior in high school or something like that. Or even, you know, really over the summer before their senior year, you know, if it's before you can really go through that financial aid process, you're just not going to know for sure until you go through it. So I think, you know, obviously you can can kind of take that information and, and you know, file it away and, and use it, but to, to not have it be an, an immediate disqualifier, I think is probably a good idea. Um, I think, you know, looking for fit both ways is, is definitely also something that students and, and families should should focus on. And you want to make sure not only obviously that, um, you know, the, the school is a good fit for you academically and otherwise, but but that, you know, you feel like you would be able to make, you know, significant contributions to that campus and, and that it would be really a good fit kind of both ways. And other than that, I think, you know, utilizing all of the resources that are available to you can, is it's only going to help you. So whether that's, you know, through your high school and, and your school counseling office or um, otherwise, um, you know, whether it's through the, the admission or financial aid office at the institutions that you're interested in, 
really, th- there are so many different people that, that are available to help you and are, are eager to help you that you definitely want to take advantage of, of what they, they can do, you know, as, as much as possible. So I, you know, I think, um, really kind of taking advantage of those resources is, is a, a great, you know, great step and a, and a great first start. Well, that's terrific, Ben. Thank you so much for your time today, your insight, your advice. This has been incredible. And I'm so happy, as I know, it's going to help so many students and their parents as they navigate through the college admissions process. I hope to have you back on the show again, Ben. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please don't forget to tell a friend and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. I am your host, John Durante, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Cap.